everybody. My name is Karen Baumert. I am the uh, Coastal Navigation Section Chief in Plan Formulation Branch, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, New York District. Um, and welcome to our public information session on the Sandy Hook to Barmageddon Inlet, Seabright to Manasquan, New Jersey, Coastal Storm Risk Management General, General Reevaluation Study. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we do have another session today at six o'clock. It will be the same information, um, the same presentation, the same presenters. Um, but there is another opportunity to to uh, for for those that may not be able to attend today at this time to join us later. So, um, why are we here today? We'll go through background information on on what this study is all about. Um, but I will like to open it up by saying this is a very early stage in the feasibility process, and we're looking to hear from you today. So there is an existing project in this study area, and this study will focus on improvements to that existing project. So, um, but before we get started, I would like to turn it over to our non-federal sponsor, um, Glenn Golden from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Would you like to say anything, Glenn? Yes, thank you for having us. Good morning, welcome to the Seabright to Mass One Feasibility Study Public Information Session. I'd like to thank you to the Army Corps of Engineers for holding this public meeting. And thank you to the municipalities for distributing the information to all interested parties. And thank you to our environmental justice team for all of your input on this project. And thank you to everybody for, for joining the meeting to learn more about this project. Uh, the NJDP Office of Coastal Engineer is a non-federal sponsor and partners with the Army Corps of Engineers for the Coastal, coastal Storm Risk Seabright to Mass One project. And uh, back to you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Appreciate that. All right, next slide, please. All right, again, thank you for participation, for per your participation. Uh, public feedback is an important part of the study process, um, and we are looking to hear from you today. Again, we are at an early stage in the feasibility study. Um, we have not yet formulated our or uh, finalized our alternatives, so we would like to hear from you and use that feedback in uh, further as we further move through the feasibility process. So. Um, the purpose of today's meeting is twofold to provide information about the Seabright to Manasquan, uh study and to um, hear your questions and feedback um, about the information shared today so that we can better inform our alternative development moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, so we're doing our welcome and sign in. And if you haven't already, um, please put your name and affiliation in the chat. That just helps us make sure we know who we're talking to and who's in attendance and for pro proper documentation. Um, then we will have a presentation by our study team, including our plan formulator, Mark Martello, Mike Martello, excuse me, um, and uh, our NEPA lead, uh, Katie Pijanowski. So they'll run through the background and the existing project, the plan formulation process, some of our measures and our potential schedule. Um, there will be a question and answer session at the end of this meeting. Um, while you are listening to our presentation, we encourage you or ask you to please um, remain muted during the presentation and we will answer all questions at the end. Um, there should be ample time to answer everyone's questions, but as your questions come up, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, this meeting, um, we are documenting all of, all of the questions and it's very helpful to have your question written in the chat. Um, so we do not paraphrase in our notes and we get your question exactly right. Um, at the end of the meeting, we will be going through all of the questions that we have received um, in the chat first and then if time allows, time should allow, but if time allows, um, we will open up the mic and have people ask their questions verbally as well. Um, next slide, please. So as you, um, if you are unfamiliar with um, WebEx, you should see at the bottom of your screen um, a chat button. It may just look like a little chat bubble. 
Um, please ensure that you have, um, when you're submitting your questions, that it goes to everyone. Um, and those answers, those questions will be answered during the question and answer session. Um, there will also be an opportunity to, um, like I said earlier, uh, verbally ask your questions. Uh, we do ask you to please use the raise hand function, and then we will go down the list if you would like to unmute at that time. All right. Um, thank you. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Mike Martello, our plan formulator on this study. He'll run through the background and the existing project. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. All right. So uh, some high level background on the project that we're talking about today from Seabright to, to Manasquan Inlet, New Jersey. Um, the initial authorization for this project uh, came back actually in the 50s. Um, however, construction of the project uh, was not actually completed until uh, the late 90s and actually up until 2016 for the small section between Elbron and Lock Harbor. Uh, with construction starting in the mid-90s, ending in Section 1, which is the north half of the project that we'll see in the, the coming slide, completing in 1999, and then Section 2, the southern half of the study area, being completed in the year 2000. Um, now, the project, you know, obviously was affected in, by Hurricane Sandy, uh, but did perform as expected. Um, however, there was, you know, still damages in addition uh, within the study area as a consequence of Sandy. Um, and partially as a consequence of observing the performance of the project during Hurricane Sandy, New Jersey DEP initially uh, requested a reevaluation of the study area, both sections one and section two, um, in 2015. However, funding was not received, and we received a follow up request back in March of 2021, which really brings us to our current study today, um, for which the feasibility cost sharing agreement was signed in October of last year. Uh, between Army Corps and New Jersey DEP, um, with the study actually being 100% federally funded by the Disaster Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of last year. Um, so, with that out of the way, um, a little bit more detail about the existing project. Um, you know, as we've kind of said multiple times by now, it's uh, the Atlantic coast spanning from Seabright to Manasquan Inlet, really the eastern seaboard, if you will, of Monmouth County, New Jersey. Uh, it's about 21 miles of shoreline where the section one, as I mentioned before, which is the north half of the project, uh, is about 12 miles of shoreline from Seabright to Lock Arbor, formerly Ocean Township, whereas section two is about nine miles from Asbury Park to Manasquan Inlet. Again, we have a, actually, I said it was lit this slide, but actually the next slide, we have a map of the, the project area. Uh, and the project on the whole is really a beach erosion control and coastal flood risk reduction project. Um, periodic uh, beach nourishment and re-nourishment of the shoreline for the, the study area um, with uh, development of a 100-foot wide berm to an elevation of plus 9.3 feet, NAVD88, re-nourishing for about on a six-year re-nourishment cycle through a 50-year period uh, through 2047 for Section 1 and 2049 for Section 2. And here we're just showing a couple pictures of some of the more recent re-nourishment projects or re-nourishment that has gone on or happened within the project, where in this top right picture here, we're showing some grading of the sand to develop the berm to the, the specified alignment, and also uh, some hydraulic placement of clean sand uh, uh, fill material as part of another uh, recent beach re-nourishment within the study area. So, you know, as we already mentioned, it's 21 miles of uh, shoreline, primarily focusing coastal flood risk reduction for the communities basically immediately adjacent to the beachfront there. Um, and while, you know, the project, as we mentioned, has been performing as expected or as desired, there are opportunities for improvement for which the study is primarily focused on. And we're really aiming to investigate if there's a technically feasible, environmentally acceptable, economically justifiable recommendation for federal participation for further improvements of the existing project. Um, and really more specifically within uh, section one, the project is focusing on uh, some erosion hotspots that have been observed really over the past uh, few decades within Elberon and Monmouth Beach, uh, which are highlighted by those, those stars on the, the map of the study area here. And as well as that, uh, looking at uh, potential improvements to further reduce inundation risks 
within section two, that section from Asbury Park to Manasquan Inlet. And here on the bottom, uh, we're just pointing out the, the profile of, I guess, uh, flood risk reduction measures that are already in place uh, along this section, both section one and section two. Uh, so with the presentation of the study area out of the way, now that we kind of know what we're talking about, we'd like to now discuss, you know, at a high level, our plan formulation process and how it applies to the project thus far. So at a very high level, uh, for those who aren't familiar, Army Corps has a rather standard plan formulation process that is applied to a wide variety of water resources projects that we investigate. Uh, the main, so the first step of this process is identifying the relevant water resources problems, opportunities, objectives, constraints, and considerations for the, the project within the study area of interest. From there, we inventory and forecast uh, future conditions, uh, which is where we are right now with our engineering team focusing on uh, quantifying and characterizing both present conditions and eventually future conditions as well. Um, with that information and that forecast of uh, conditions, we begin to formulate alternative plans, uh, alternative plans to, you know, augment the existing project in this case. And that will consist of identifying potential measures. Uh, screening those measures and combining those measures into alternatives. And you can think of measures as conceptual building blocks of alternatives that once they're placed in a specific location and added together, they become an alternative. So for instance, uh, at, with the existing project, we have beach nourishment along the, the project area so that beach nourishment is a measure, but beach nourishment at specific locations and to specific design requirements then becomes an alternative. Uh, with a set of alternatives uh, formulated, we then evaluate the effect that these alternative plans will have on the study area. Uh, and further, we screen these alternatives for completeness, effectiveness, efficiency, and acceptability. We then compare how these alternatives perform against a future without project condition baseline, which in this case would be the existing project as it is currently formulated without any additional improvements. And with the uh, those evaluations, we are then able to also assess the environmental impacts and the economic analysis or performance, if you will, of the alternatives, really ensuring that the benefit cost ratio is greater than one for any project that would end up being recommended. Um, that allows us to ultimately compare these alternatives and then finally select an alternative, which would be our tentatively selected plan. Uh, so we've already touched on the problems for the study area here. Uh, and as we mentioned previously, it's uh, uh, erosion hotspots within Monmouth Beach and Elberon. And so here we're showing uh, recently nourished uh, beach uh, from satellite imagery at both of these locations. And I'll flip through these this slide and the next slide quickly so you can see how quickly uh, the beach has erodes over time. So just over the span of four years in Monmouth Beach and two years in Elberon, we can see how rapidly recent nourishment projects uh, or recent renourishment at these locations gets eroded away. Um, so that's part of the part of the reason why we're interested in investigating these two areas is that they require more frequent renourishment than was initially anticipated, which uh, ultimately, you know, uh, is a, is problematic for the performance of the existing project. Uh, in addition to that, we're also, as I mentioned previously, focused on inundation risk within section two. And so here we're just showing the FEMA designated one in a hundred year and one in 200 year floodplain within the study area within section two specifically, which is broken down into those reaches four and five shown there. And I should point out here that the study area is really just this jagged edge polygon, if you will, um, and reformulating the existing projects to evaluate if there's uh, justification for additional improvements uh, in flood risk reduction within section two. Uh, and now just to sort of visualize inundation risk within section two, uh, looking at satellite imagery from sample area here, Spring Lake, uh, we can see uh, prior to Sandy, uh, the satellite imagery of this section here, uh, this is uh, September, 2010. And post Sandy, we see a significant amount of overwash really where you can see where the sand, you know, came from the beach inland into the neighborhood with overwash denoting, you know, the spread inland of the, the actual inundation. 
And so this is the type of event, you know, that we're looking to further mitigate risk against within the study area. Uh, so now that we're, we've got the uh, problems briefly discussed and outlined, we'd also like to briefly highlight our future without project condition uh, for which we are considering uh, future increases in, in sea level rise. And these projected future increases will likely increase the uh, rate of erosion at those erosion hotspots we identified and also is expected to increase inundation risk throughout the entire study area, but of course within section two as well. And the existing project I should highlight is only authorized to provide nourishment uh, on that six year cycle through the year 2047. Um, so now that we've discussed our problems, um, we'd like to briefly overview our problems, opportunities, objectives, and constraints. So we've already touched on the problems, but mainly it's a risk to human health, uh, sorry, human life, health, and safety from coastal storms, and also the higher than expected renourishment costs and risks of performance of the existing coastal storm risk management, that's CSRM features, really uh, talking about the high erosion hotspots in section one. Now in section two, we're primarily focused on uh, the storm damages due to erosion, inundation, and wave action, obviously relating to coastal storms. Uh, the opportunity here for this project is to better manage the coastal system on the whole and consider regional interactions uh, within the, alter the new alternative uh, improvements that we propose. Uh, additionally, there's opportunity to, for the project to consider the latest technology standards and engineering guidance, as well as to provide benefits to the environment and improve recreation within the study area. As such, our objectives are through the period of analysis to First, manage the direct and indirect risks to human life, health, and safety caused by coastal storms impacting the study area, as well as to manage structure damage and other national economic development impacts caused by coastal flooding uh, and inducing flooding and erosion within the study area. Um, our constraints here are obviously not to increase the rate of erosion within the study area. That would be counter to our objective here. And our additional considerations are to ensure that we're not reducing or uh, public access uh, to consider impacts to historically disadvantaged communities, as well as impacts to structures and on land facilities, as well as to environmental and cultural slash historic resources and attempt to minimize the impact on existing utilities and induce flooding within and beyond the study area. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Katie, who is going to discuss uh, the environmental aspects of our project thus far. Okay, thank you. As a part of this plan formulation process, uh, we are doing our documentation under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Um, it's a suite of multiple laws and executive orders and regulations uh, which are considered under this umbrella policy, including the National Historic Preservation Act, the Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, Clean Air Act, Environmental Justice, and other state laws. There are four different types of NEPA documents, which document potential impacts um, uh, from four recommended projects. Uh, they are on the screen here, listed from the lowest level of analysis required to the most level of analysis required. At this stage of the process, we don't have any alternatives developed, um, so we do not have a NEPA document identified at this time. Uh, the level of NEPA analysis and type of document that will be prepared will be determined once we have a tentatively selected plan. As stated um, previously, uh, there are multiple laws that are covered under the under NEPA and that we will be coordinating on. We will be working with our non-federal sponsor, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And we have identified and are working with several cooperating agencies, including the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Under the Endangered Species Act, there are multiple threatened and endangered species managed by both National Marine Fisheries Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, species that are managed include three spe two species of bat, rosy tern, 
the piping plover, red knot, northeastern beach tiger, and sea beach amaranth with the candidate species of the monarch butterfly. Uh, there is a photo of the piping plover on the lower left side. And under National Marine Fisheries Service, there are four species of turtle, the Atlantic sturgeon, and two species of whales that are managed. To date, we have held our interagency meeting. Uh, so we have introduced this study to our resource agencies. Um, we have sent cooperating agency letters. Um, we have obtained official species lists from both the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service, as well as state listed species from the New, New Jersey Heritage Program. Our cultural team has developed a programmatic agreement, which was executed in 2022 and sent consultation letters to the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office, the Delaware Tribe, the Delaware Nation, and the Shawnee Tribe. We have prepared draft biological assessment uh, consultations, and we have started to coordinate this project with the National Marine Fisheries, with National Marine Fisheries Service. We have also developed a communication plan as part of the early stages of this process. Until we get to the tentatively selected plan, we do have um, several environmental tasks and coordination um, that will be upcoming. We are going to continue to refine the future without project conditions, uh, participate in alternative development, screening, and selection as well as document the existing conditions of the study area. We, would, we do continue to seek public input and outreach while we continue resource agency coordination and tribal coordination. There will be additional impacts for public engagement, and one of which is the draft release of our NEPA document. Um, coordinate Coastal Zone Management Act compliance, uh, Clean Water Act compliance, and Clean Air Act compliance, as, other, as well as several other uh, laws and regulations that we need to identify. All right, great. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate the, the comprehensive summary. Uh, so now we'll move on to briefly discussing, discussing, discussing the potential measures uh, that we're considering for both Section 1 and Section 2 of the project. Uh, so now at a very high level, uh, within Army Corps, we conceptualize uh, coastal storm risk management measures in three broad categories, uh, nature-based solutions, structural measures, I should say, and also non-structural measures. Now, for the nature-based solutions or nature-based measures, um, we first have burn modifications, which is beach nourishment, essentially, as is being done for the current project, uh, modifying the berm of an existing beach to a specified width and design elevation. Additionally, there are some submerged artificial reefs, which are primarily are placed offshore, uh, just, I guess, offshore of the, the beach or uh, shoreline of interest, and are primarily intended to reduce the wave height of the waves during a storm event that are actually impacting the shoreline. Additionally, there's also dunes, uh, which typically also include plantings on top of the dunes to stabilize the, the sand that has been placed in the dune. And additionally, there's also reinforced dunes, which in addition to plantings, also typically have some sort of hardened core feature, be it a sheet pile wall or geotextiles or geotextiles plus armoring stones and sheet pile wall. Uh, now, for structural measures, there's flood walls and sea walls, which uh, you know hopefully don't need much explaining. And there are actually some sea walls within the northern portion of section one of the study area. Uh, additionally, there are groins, which are, are long, uh, I guess, big piles of rocks, if you will, um, that are primarily intended to uh, capture longshore sediment transport and basically keep sand from uh, being transported or yeah, I guess transported across the beach and keep the shoreline stabilized. Uh, additionally, there are breakwaters, which again are large piles of rocks or riprap uh, now positioned offshore and to perform a similar uh, perform similarly to the, the submerged artificial reef as they're intended to reduce wave height that's actually impacting the shoreline of interest. And lastly, here we have backpassing listed as a structural measure. Could be a nature-based solution depending on how you characterize it, but essentially uh, backpassing is taking 
uh, sediment or sand that has been uh, transported downshore and moving it back upshore and using that sand to develop a specified berm profile or beach profile. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned before, we have non-structural alternatives. This includes acquisition of property and relocation as well, along with elevation of existing structures and uh, important uh, part of that is also elevating uh, critical infrastructure relevant to whatever structure of interest, such as air conditioning units, electrical boxes, et cetera. And lastly, there's also flood proofing, either dry or wet flood proofing, uh, where dry flood proofing is ensuring that the structure does not get wet. Wet flood proofing being the structure is allowed to have water pass through in a certain area. Uh, so these are the measures at a very high level that we're considering, uh, but now talking a little bit more specifically about both section one and section two, we've already done some preliminary screening of these measures. And here for section one, again, those erosion hotspots in Elberon and Monument Beach, we're primarily focused on first with the nature-based solutions, uh, modifications of the existing berm or nicely uh, further refining the proposed periodic renourishment profiles for these locations, as well as uh, submerged artificial reefs. Um, in terms of structural measures, we're considering groins, either in addition of new groins or modification of the existing groins within that portion of the study area, as well as breakwaters and sand backpassing specifically for the Monmouth Beach uh, hotspot. And lastly, in terms of uh, non-structural measures, uh, we're considering acquisition and relocation within uh, for these hotspots within section one. And I should point out that we screened out uh, revetments, which weren't shown on the prior slide, uh, and also elevation and flood proofing. Uh, and these measures were screened based on uh, acceptability, technical feasibility, economic justification, other social effects and our perception at present time of their ability to meet objectives and avoid constraints that we presented earlier. Now, in terms of section two, again, looking at inundation risk reduction between Asbury Park and Manasquan Inlet, uh, in terms of nature-based solutions, we're considering burn modifications, dunes, as well as reinforced dunes. Um, and for structural uh, measures, we're considering flood walls or sea walls, as well as non-structural measures, uh, acquisition, relocation, elevation and flood proofing. And we screened out levees, which again, weren't shown on the prior slide, uh, mainly because those would take up more space. Um, and I guess just for completeness sake, a levee would be uh, a large berm that has some sort of planting on top of it, um, designed to different uh, slopes and specifications, typically also with a clay uh, wall of clay in the middle, if you will. Um, whereas, a, and that contrasts with the dune, which is smaller and primarily composed only of sand. Uh, so, with all that out of the way, those are the measures we're considering. Um, and as I mentioned, we've started screening those measures, but now we'll briefly discuss our project schedule, you know, where we've been and where we're headed. Uh, so, you know, I, I should point out, uh, otherwise everybody's going to be upset with me internally, that uh, our, our schedule is certainly subject to change. Um, you know, all of our dates in the future are really listed as tentative at present point in time. Um, but, you know, we've talked briefly about some of our initial scoping tasks, and we're currently in this eval alternative evaluation and analysis phase, uh, which will eventually lead to our feas feasibility level analysis and selection of our plan, and ultimately transmission of our plan and report to Washington for Washington level review. Um, we've thus far, as I mentioned at the outset, signed our feasibility cost share agreement with New Jersey DEP back in October of last year. And we also had our internal alternative milestone meeting uh, back in February of this year, which is really uh, where we finalize our scope for the study. Um, and now we're currently in public engagement uh, at the beginning of our alternative anal analysis phase. Uh, very helpful to hear your feedback and comments, uh, particularly with respect to the proposed measures that we're considering. Um, and at, at the, towards the end of this phase here, uh, we're actually uh, going to be developing a tentatively selected plan, uh, which actually leads into the next portion of the, uh, the next phase with concurrent release of a draft report. Uh, that will eventually lead to our agency decision milestone and transmittal of our final report. And ultimately, uh, the uh, depending on if a project is recommended, a uh, chief's report being uh, delivered to, to Washington. Yeah, and so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Karen, who will uh, close us out and begin our Q&A session. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Katie. Um, 
Great. So thanks for the presentation. Uh, that was a good amount of information. So we're assuming that you guys have some questions. Um, we are here now to answer your questions, but if anything should uh, come up later, you can feel free to email us at seabrightmanasquan at armycorps.army.mil. Um, that is our inbox, and we have um, a bunch of team members that monitor that email address. So please feel free to email us any questions after this, um, and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Uh, for our main point of contacts for this uh, study is Jason Shea, our project manager. He is also the project manager for the existing Seabirds Menisquan um, project that is currently undergoing re-nourishment in its um, operation and maintenance phase. And um, Katie, who is our uh, NEPA lead that you heard from earlier. So there are more opportunities to provide feedback. Um, again, there will be a public information meeting during the public comment period of the draft integrated report. Again, subject to change, but we're looking to have that in the next year. Um, and uh, all any additional meeting information or study changes, study schedule changes will be posted on our website and shared via email. 